If listening to Unforgotten has inspired you to create your own podcast, you're in luck. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can make your own podcast and share it with the world. And the Spotify platform makes it super easy to get started. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter where you are when an idea hits, you're ready to start recording. Spotify for Podcasters makes it easy to distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Plus, you can do video podcasts and engage with fans through Q&A and polls. You can even earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's free. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters and sign up for your free account to start recording and sharing your podcast with the world. This week on Unforgotten. Charles Chapman, a 25-year-old who seemingly had it all, vanished into thin air. I actually left with Riles, and I mean, that was it. We're never apart, you know, after that. It's very easy just to hit that one connection when you're young that throws your whole path in a different direction. So he gets out of my car, takes off. I say that it, it was kind of like a light switch. It was. It was like I was talking to somebody completely different. All he had on, he was barefooted. He had no shirt on. He had his box. After he left, a call comes into Ryle's phone, and Wes recognized the name. The missing person case involves children. Percussions are particularly profound. This little girl, this was, he knew. I just miss him a lot. He's not alone in this. And that we love him deeply. Hey everyone, this is Sellers. And this is Stormy. And, and this, this is Unforgotten. Unforgotten where each episode will highlight unsolved missing, murdered, and suspicious death cases in Alabama in order to raise awareness and hopefully obtain some answers for victims and their families. Please remember that any individual referenced in the podcast should be considered innocent until found guilty in a court of law, and any opinions or views expressed in the podcast are solely those of participants. Listener discretion is advised as some of the content discussed in the podcast may contain violence or graphic descriptions and may not be suitable for all audiences. Be sure to join our Unforgotten Patreon channel today to gain exclusive benefits, including early access to ad-free episodes and bonus content. By subscribing, you'll also be supporting the efforts of ACCA in assisting families and raising awareness for Alabama cold cases. Now for episode 20, Riles Chapman. Hey guys, and welcome back. How you been, Stormy? Oh, you know, fair to Midland. We've had a little bit of crud going around between the two of us, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, I wish it would go away. Yeah, you're sounding better though. Am I? Yeah. I don't feel like it. You probably don't feel like it on your end. I don't either, but hopefully we're on the better end of things now. Obviously don't sound too much better here at the house because my dad called me this weekend. My niece's birthday was this weekend and I didn't go because I don't think I'm contagious, but my grandparents were going to be there and I don't want to risk like spreading the plague is what oh, it feels yeah. like I have. <laughs> but my brother came and picked up my son to take him. And I guess he told them, I guess I, you know, had had the plague essentially. <laughs> so I get a yeah. call from my dad telling me, oh, he told us you've got fluid behind your ear. You sound terrible and you need to go to the doctor. What are you doing? <laughs> I know you don't like shots, but you just need to go get the shot and get it over with. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting here thinking I'm going to kick this child's butt when he gets back. <laughs> for going and making it sound so bad. And I was like, I'll go Monday if I don't feel any better. It's Monday. So by the time this comes out, sorry, Dad, I did not go. <laughs> but then my, my son comes in and we're sitting there eating dinner. And he said, are you still feeling bad? And mm -hmm. I was like, well, I mean, I feel better. I just, you know, have some 
sinus drainage. And he said, well, maybe you should have went to the doctor like granddaddy said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, gang up on me then. Yeah. <laughs> Are you feeling better? I am. Yeah. I stood last night. I think I just, because I took it so easy yesterday, and I just decided I needed to do that or it was just going to drag. And I think I did a good thing by doing that. I saw an article this weekend. I didn't get a chance to read it before I was trying to get to it. And then I cleared my notifications and I didn't mean to, but it was in my Apple News that a new scientific study has come out proving that people do actually share brain waves. Oh. That you can like sync your brain waves. And I think that's what's happened. I think so too. Across hmm. the U.S., we've synced brain waves and apparently help waves. I guess. Wow. <laughs> We're special. So in case you guys hadn't seen it on the page, um, we realized that we really hadn't said anything in the recording. Our merch store is live on the website. Yeah. And really okay. nice stuff, I think, personally. I like my t-shirt that I got. Oh, yeah. I like the shirts. They're really soft. Yeah, they are. They're very comfy. We've got some of the Alabama Cold Case logo shirts. We've got an Unforgotten Podcast shirt. Yes, we do. And then everybody's favorite, we've got the Unsolved shirt that has the names of the victims that have been sent to us over the last year that yeah. form the state of Alabama. That it's and already outdated. I know. It never fails. We think we've got everybody that's been submitted to us. And we know that it is just, you know, a drop in the bucket, really. But one, we can include the people that we don't know about. We have tried to put everybody that we've been told about, and it's not intentional if there's not a name on there. Um, most of the time, it's just because we don't, we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And of course, like every time that we do a t-shirt, you know, we have to, at one point or another, we have to stop for the current shirt. And that also isn't intentionally meaning to hurt anybody's feelings or anything. It's just, you have to, you have to put a, a stopping point at some point or you'll never get the t-shirt out. Right. And it never fails. There's always new names that come up. And it's heartbreaking, actually. It is. Definitely the shirts have probably doubled. Don't you think the names have probably doubled in size? Oh, gosh, yes. You can check those out. You can go to alcoldcase.com and click on the little menu at the top. And it says ACCA merch, and it'll take you to the merch store. There's T-shirts, and there's a flag that has the unsolved graphic on it, coffee mugs, mouse pads, and other random little knickknacks in there. Right. You can also sign the petition to the legislature to get the Victims' Families' Rights Act into a bill in front of the legislature for voting. I think that's something that's really important to try to get passed here in Alabama. It is. And, you know, we we haven't been really pushing that as much over the last few months, but we're trying to kind of get back on the, on the wagon with that because, you know, we have so many states now trying to get that passed and now that, you know, we have the federal law. Yep. Um, we've also had a couple of people ask us if there is a way to donate outside of just subscribing to the podcast channel or to the Patreon. And there is. There is. <laughs> if you go to the website, there's actually a donate button on the menu. Um, and you can set it up as a one-time or recurring thing. Yeah. So today we're diving into the disappearance of Jefferson Riles Chapman, a young man who vanished without a trace on December 18th, 2013, in the small city of Dothan, Alabama. Dothan, as you might remember, we talked about a little bit about in our last episode. It's located in the southeastern part of the state. Dothan is filled with a rich history and vibrant culture. And Dothan's historical narrative begins with agricultural roots. And as we sort of mentioned and discussed last time, and it looks like Sellers uh, researched a little bit more, <laughs> uh, it is known as the peanut capital of the world, which surprises me because I thought Georgia was, you know, the, like the state. So, you know, with the peanut farmer, um, our former president. Well, after we talked about that last week, I was like, I need to look this up and see if I'm remembering right. And yeah, I did. I did. I was so surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the fertile soil of the white grass region nurtured the thriving peanut industry, transforming Dothan into a bustling hub of commerce and trade. Today, a quarter of the peanuts in the United States are harvested within 75 miles of Dothan. As you walk through the streets of Dothan's historic downtown district, 
Stories whisper from the weather facade, inviting visitors to step back in time. From the Barber Vintage Motorsports Museum to the Wiregrass Museum of Art, Dothan celebrates its history by preserving the artifacts and memories that shaped it. While Dothan is a serene and close-knit community known for its picturesque landscapes and warm-hearted locals, beneath the tranquil surface lies a web of unanswered questions and an unsolved mystery that has left the Chapman family and the community in a state of shock and bewilderment for nearly a decade. On that fateful December day, Riles Chapman, a 25-year-old who seemingly had it all, vanished into thin air. When we research cases, we try to go back as far as we can to get an idea of exactly who the person, in this case Riles, is. You know, sometimes when we hear stories, it's almost like it's exactly that, a story. Right. And, you know, with the stories, it actually, people often say that. And then the more you think about it, it's not a story, but it has to, it has to be spread as a story for people to understand what happened. It, it turns more into entertainment. Exactly. I feel like. And gossip and interest and less, almost like the fact that there is actually a person, a real person, who had a family, who had a life, a real life, who had children, all of that kind of gets lost in the, oh my gosh, did you hear about this part? Oh my gosh, guess what I heard? Mm -hmm. I guess that part gets frustrating sometimes. I mean, yeah, everybody wants to know what's going on. And I understand the interest in it. Obviously, there's an interest in it. There's a reason we're doing this. And it's because there is kind of that morbid curiosity, I guess. Yeah. And it's a hope that people listening, because they're interested and because they will share the story with people they know, will eventually get to somebody that has information that can bring it forward. Right. But it also, you just want to remind people, hey, just remember, this isn't like a fairy tale story that you're telling your kids at night that never happened. This is real. There's a real person behind this. Yeah, it isn't a boogeyman story to share for fun. It's people's, real people's lives. Yeah, and it's important. Yeah. You know, there's such a big movement among certain creators online and the more well-known one that comes to mind is Maura Murray. Her family has had such a is such a time of it with um, the way that the story has been spread and shared and content creators wanting to take credit for the stories and they're not stories and you know we we all need to keep that in mind and I think you and I try to do that as best we can is to make sure that we know this is for the families and not for us. And we sat down with Wes Chapman, Raul's father, and one of the comments that he actually made during our conversation was that they had shared a couple of podcast episodes on Raul's case that had been done without their permission. But he said, you know, there wasn't anything wrong with the podcast episodes. We do podcast episodes sometimes where we haven't spoken to the family members. Yep. We are hesitant sometimes to reach out to families directly because some people don't want to talk about it. Right. And sometimes we know ahead of time that that's historically at least been that way with the family. Right. Sometimes it's just a matter of not even being able to get a hold of somebody that we'd be able to talk to. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, a good way that you can go about sharing information. And then there, there are ways that are more harmful than helpful. Right. I don't know. It's just something I think that we try to be mindful of and a lot of other people try to be mindful of or are starting to try to be mindful of maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just a conversation that's been happening a lot yeah. more recently, I think, among the podcast community in general, even though we're new to that community. Yeah. We follow a lot of those creators. Yeah. And just in general on social media, even the ones that are, they're more like influencers rather than creators. But I think one of the reasons why it's been on my mind is there was a comment on our page recently and it infuriated me to no end. We shared a post and I am not going to say which post it was. And there was a comment that said something along the lines of, I hate to say it's been X number of years. They're gone. 
it was the most distasteful thing to say because families see that. Yes. And immediately we took it off because Mm -hmm. don't come on our page where families are trying to raise awareness for these unsolved cases, especially on a missing person case where there are cases, even if they are few and far between, where people have been found years later. Exactly. You can't take away the hope from these families that that might happen for them. We are trying to help families find answers and we are trying to help them maintain whatever hope they have. So don't come on our page with negative thoughts and any kind of irrelevant opinions. If you have something negative to say that has no bearing whatsoever on the cases that we're posting about, don't comment. Yeah. We're going to delete it and we're probably going to block you, to be honest. If you've got some information that probably a family member wouldn't want to read, but you think the police or whoever is investigating should know, you can send it to us in a private message. You can send it to us in an email. You can send it to us through our website. You can send it to the agency itself. But do not put something on our page where a family member can see it that would put them through more grief and more heartache than what they are currently going through. It's wrong. It's rude. It's distasteful. And it's just low. It's low. I've just been fuming over that since it happened. Yeah, you're not the only one. It's not the first time, but that one just really pushed me over the edge, I guess. Yeah, I think so far, most of the comments that are similar to that have been maybe a little more subtle, I guess. they You can tell that's what they're getting at or they'll have a conversation and kind of ease into saying something like that. This was just pretty much right out there and I was pretty livid myself. And we try to encourage people to have open conversations back and forth because sometimes it helps to have those conversations okay. because you never know what's going to trigger a memory. Exactly. Yep. But you can do it in a respectful way, in a respectful manner. This wasn't that. Yeah. It just has no place on our site or, in my opinion, any other victim advocacy site or Mm-mm. families pages or anything for that matter. No. Nope. I mean, I don't think that we're very strict. We don't have a lot of, you know, we don't censor a whole lot on the page. We try not to anyway, Mm -hmm. but we will when it comes to the families that we're dealing with. Those are our families and we are very protective of them. It is the reason we're here and we want to do whatever we can to help them. If we allow those kinds of things to happen on our site, then we're not helping them anymore. Like Sellers says, if you feel like you can't, well, like like my mama used to say, <laughs> if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Just go. Just keep on scrolling. Yep. Sorry for that soapbox. A little round. Yeah. Yeah. So we did sit down with Wes, and we asked him to tell us what life was like for the Chapman family. Um, my wife and I, we've been married 40 years. Um... We met, we are both from the same hometown, Lakeland, Georgia, which is basically about 30, 35 miles from where we're living at now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we were, we were married back in 81. Uh, no, we met in 81, married in 83. So uh, we have um, four children. Um, our oldest is Wes, who's 39. Riles is 34. Uh, Matt is 32. And Mary Catherine, we had her later. Um, she's 23. So Riles and Matt were re- very close just because of age. Um, you know, they pretty much grew up together. Um, and um, early on, they were always in sports, mainly baseball. Um, Rollerblading back then was a big thing, so they were big skateboarders and rollerbladers in their young, in elementary, junior high type age. Um, in high school, uh, both Matthew and Riles um, played golf. They were excellent golfers. Um, both of them went to state. Um, they played for their local high school. The high school they went to, they played golf. Um, and uh, just a normal, you know, just normal, everyday uh, family, you know. So 
Riles, um, he was going to stay over in uh, your neck of the woods, actually. Um, um, and they played at that, and I forget the name of it, but it's a Robert Trent um, golf course over in, near Mobile or north of Mobile. So he and I, um, I, I went with him. I, I drove him over there. We'd get a hotel. The, at that time, there was a Edwin Williams or, or, or whatever the name of the golf store was there. And I'm like, Ross, you want to, you know, you want to go get a, some, you know, new clothes to look the part, you know, because we were, we were going to win this thing, you know. So uh, he went and uh, he got some flashy clothes, you know, yellow flacks and, you know, a loud shirt. So, you know, he, he definitely stood out. And so we get up and we talk a little bit about the game and uh, uh, we'd already been on the practice course the day before. So uh, we kind of knew the uh, the course itself. So on the first tee off, there is a dog leg to the left. And there's a huge gongus um, pine tree. I mean, I'm talking about it's huge. And um, so Riles had you know, been joking along that night and the next morning that, you know, he's going to go the easy route. He's going to hit it over that tree. I'm like, Riles, please don't do that. Please don't do that. I'm like, let's start off. Let's just be conservative. No, Dad, no, Dad. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm here to win it. So I've got to take this. Like, Dang. Okay. So um, so we're there and it's his time. They announce his name and all. So he gets up there and we're ready to tee off. And he looks over at me and he looks at that tree. And he looks over at me again, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> All of a sudden, he swung back, and he hit that ball, and I swear, I thought it was going to clear it, and it nicked the very top of that tree and bounced to the cart path, and they were paid for that path. <laughs> and that ball bounced almost over into the next hole. Oh my god! <laughs> I like I told you I told you I was like you may as well just relax now just have a good time. So that was you know that was the that was a good time at uh, State with Riles. The Chapmans seem to embody the very essence of family unity. Their unbreakable bond is evident even in the midst of tragedy. From past to the present, they remain connected, cherishing every moment spent together. As parents, Wes and Jamie seemed to be loving and nurturing parents who set guiding principles that served as stepping stones for their children's aspirations. The rules weren't merely restrictive boundaries, as sometimes they are with families, but rather empowering pathways designed to help their children flourish. That's kind of what I got through talking to him. They spent a lot of time together, Mm -hmm. and it sounded more like they wanted to give their kids the best opportunity to reach their highest potential. We don't feel like they were ever school children um, because we did, uh, we had rules we made and, and, you know, as soon as they were able to work, they had jobs. Um, so yeah, it's just a, just an average. Yeah. And I think, you know, we'll get more into that later in the podcast, but, you know, even with their grandchildren and their mother, they've folded them into the family in almost the same way. Yeah, it seems like to be in the Chapman family, you don't have to be born to the Chapman family. It yeah. sounds like, yeah. you know, there are no strangers to yeah. being encouraging parents to really anybody who needs those. Right. The Chapman kids blossomed in their own unique ways each carving out a path towards fulfillment. Wes, the oldest, found his calling as a dedicated special ed teacher. And I have super respect for that because that's a difficult job. And those Mm -hmm. kids, you know, well, they're not all kids either. That takes a lot of hard work. And those that they're teaching are just endlessly loving souls, usually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's a tough path. I mean, not that anything, you know, all good careers, I'm supposed to have their hard paths, but that's just, I love that. I actually looked into doing that when I was really young for a while. Matthew thrived in the world of sales, and I have to give him a whole other round of kudos because I cannot do sales. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could do sales. 
I can't, I just, for some reason, I cannot look at somebody and try to ask them to buy something from me. (laughs) Please don't try to sell me anything because Uh -uh. I am a sucker. I'm a (laughs) sucker. Well, and gosh, you know, like when my kids were younger and they'd have to sell things for school or scouts or whatever, you know, I had Did the you buy it worst all? time. Oh my gosh. I mean, I would like, they, you know, you could take them to work or whatever and send them on your desk or whatever. I'd never push them on anybody. It's like, I know, I was if somebody the same saw way. it, they could buy it. Yes, I know. <laughs> so, yeah. So kudos there too. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Mary Catherine, the youngest. She discovered a passion as a speech therapist. Again, wow, that's that's also a hard thing. I have a couple of friends who have kids that have like the list because of the, what do they call it? Well, tongue tied or whatever. Oh, they yeah. Go through speech therapy. So anyway, all of these kids pursued really unique and wonderful careers. And seemed to be thriving. Yeah, yeah. And they stuck together and they celebrated mm-hmm. that together. However, Rawls, the second oldest, seemed to kind of wander amidst a sea of possibilities, unable to find that one spark that really ignited his soul. Mm. Nevertheless, none of the Chapman children could be labeled as what one would consider troublemakers. In fact, it wasn't really trouble that plagued Rawls, per se, but rather the unfortunate company he kept and the path he stumbled upon, one that led him towards the harrowing grip of addiction. And you know, this is tough. so easy. Yeah, it's so, I you say it's tough, I say it's easy. Different, different thing though. Yeah. I, you know, it's very easy just to hit that one connection when you're mm-hmm. young that throws your whole path in a different direction. You know, like you were saying, he, he wasn't, you know, a bad kid. His parent, he had a wonderful family. He loved his family too. And, you know, I think it wasn't for lack of, well, not necessarily lack for trying, but he just didn't find what he, he didn't find that passion, like you were saying before. And when you don't have a passion, you're kind of always looking, I guess maybe is where I'm going with that. And you have the right person come into your path when that's going on and that just changes. And part of that too, you know, he was young and I think there's a difference in personality and behaviors. You know, there's studies out there about like, the order in which your children are born, like, you know, the first one is almost always like driven and independent because they're learning to do everything first, essentially, you know, and um, the second one, a lot of times has the first one to do those things for them. Not that this is the case. This this is just a generalization. I think that a pediatrician told my mom that one time, I think that my brother was a little bit, there were two years between us. I think my brother was a little bit slower talking than what I was. And the pediatrician was like, there's nothing wrong with him. She's just doing it for him. Yeah. And it's because I was saying everything for him. And mm-hmm. huh, now he never shuts up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I know he listens. So, you know, it's just, I think some of that is just him being younger. And sure. if the people you surround yourself with are on that path of, I'm getting to the career I want to have for the rest of my life. I'm working towards being successful and settling down and all of these things. Then your goals kind of mimic the people that you surround yourself with. But if the people that you've surrounded yourself with aren't kind of looking towards those aspects in life, then you're going to want to do the things that they're doing. What are the majority of the people that you're hanging out with doing? It sounds more like his group of associates at the time or the latter. Yeah. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't help. I think I kind of got the impression that when he's going down a path to something that he wants to reverse, he's a little stubborn. Like it's Mm -hmm. hard for him to admit that he shouldn't be doing that. He needs a little prompting. Mm -hmm. So if he hasn't admitted that to anybody who can help him, you know, then that doesn't. That doesn't help him at all. Like maybe there's a little bit of embarrassment mm-hmm. by it, and he needs somebody to tell him it's okay. Yeah. We don't love you any less because people make mistakes. Yep. You know, come on, let's let's get it fixed. Yep. Come on. But you got to want to fix it. And I think that was something, um, and we'll kind of get into that in a little bit, about kind of a struggle maybe that parents sometimes have with when do you decide to bail your kids out? And when do you say, I can't do it anymore? Yeah. 
Well, you know, when you stop enabling, I guess, is really where what it boils down to. Because, you know, sometimes, especially with addiction particularly, since that's the main reason why parents go through this, is you can be helpful if it's early enough on. You can be helpful by doing, you know, you can have a little bit of tough love, at the, you know, the beginning. But usually that's not in the form of anything about letting them flounder and, you know, go down a bad path. But you always want to help them. You always want to try to bail them out. But you also, for one, it can hurt yourself when you're doing that. Um, but also it doesn't really help them because that just, it, it gives them the knowledge that it doesn't matter if they keep doing it because they'll always get bailed out. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, enabling them, sometimes it just boils down to you just can't do it anymore, like you said. Jamie and I were uh, on a quick uh, vacation over to New Orleans. Um, Riles was probably 17-ish because Wes was still, our oldest son was still at home. And that night, uh, this was this was one of the first episodes we had with Riles. Wes called and said, Dad, you need, y'all need to get home. He said, Riles and a bunch of his buddies, high school buddies, got caught with pot and they were at the Boy Scout corporate office in the, in the parking lot at night and uh, they were buying it, I guess a joint from uh, this guy and the cops drove up and well, they took it took them all to the diversion center because he was too young to go to jail. And uh, so Jamie and I would fly in, come home and get home about lunch that next day. And they would let us go out there and get him. You know, they were gonna release them only to a parent, the parents. So we went out, both Jamie and I went out and got him and, you know, just sat in the parking lot and talked about, you know, what was good, why and, who was it? And he wouldn't tell us. And he wouldn't tell us. I'm like, I tell you what, Ross, you see that uh, diversion center right there? We got you out. We didn't have to get you out. We got you out. You're going to tell me who supplied you guys with that? No, Dad, I'm not. I'm like, okay. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to tell him to come get you. So you know, it's tough love sometimes. And uh, he, he said, okay, okay, okay. So he told us, well. We go to the people's house and I go up and say, come on, Miles, we're going to go knock on the door and talk to the parents. Because he was in high school. The kid that sold it was in high school. And the mother came to the door and I'm like, well, I'll tell her. And so he tells her and, uh, you know, just one of those parents that didn't believe it. I said, well, ma'am, um, you do with what you want to with this information, but I'm just telling you that... He better not come around my son again. So that was that little episode. That was probably the first shocking type, drug type situation that we had we had with Riles. Another episode that didn't have anything to do with drugs. It had to do with him and um, Chelsea, where um, they were at a nightclub downtown. And my office is right downtown as well. And he gets into basically a a bar fight, if you will, and gets kicked out. He's in the parking lot across from my office, which all of us within a block area. And uh, he gets arrested for that. He had to, you know, pay the fine. Well, I wouldn't pay it. So he had to work the fine off. So they would, he dressed in orange, you know, and I'd see him basically on a daily basis, you know, doing just, I guess, maybe service to raise the money to, make, I forget, maybe like two weeks or something. And I just would not pay it. You know, he, I, would, I would see him out there and I'd go out there and, you know, he's like, how you like me now? I'm like, son, I love you just the same, you know, um, and you'll get through this as well. You know, just a little bit of tough love just to try again to make him change his ways. You know, we were not, uh, you know, slap on a wrist and just don't do it again. We we tried to, if they get into trouble, we always told them, you're going to have to get yourself out. We just knew something was going on with that because uh, he was on it way too long. And so uh, before they would prescribe it, he would have to go back to the doctor and I guess get reevaluated by a psychiatrist or whatever they are. So I would, uh, at this point in time, where I was, didn't have a job, he didn't have money to buy it didn't have uh, medical insurance because he was already off hours. So I was 
you know, I would not buy his prescription unless I went and found out what's going on. So we, I went to the next doctor's appointment and we sat down with uh, Dr. Lopez and I told him my concerns and um, that was that. So we go, we leave, we get the prescription, we leave the doctor's office and we go to the local drugstore to get the prescription filled. So I go in to get it, the prescription, and Riles was in the car and uh, I get in the car and he said, okay, like just put his hand out for the prescription. And I'm like, mm, this is not the way this is gonna go from here on out. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna be in charge of this and I'm gonna give it to you based on the way that the prescription shows. Um, well, he did not like that answer. And we were in the middle of, you know, in town, busy intersection. So he gets out of my car and just takes off. He had a temper and he just took off. And I'm like, dang, what you know. What? So um, he stayed gone um, for about probably three weeks. Um, he was living in what they call the uh, historical district uh, of Dothan. Amidst the uncertainties in Ryle's life, he found Chelsea. Like any other young couple, they had a fair share of disagreements and misunderstandings. I mean, who doesn't? Yeah. <laughs> but their connection really did run deep. We were at a, I don't remember if it was a sorority party or a fraternity party, but, and I remember walking out, it was two double doors, and I remember I just, I saw him open the door for me and I was like, Riles. And, you know, cause I, I knew him like just a little bit from Dothan, not, you know, a lot because he kind of grew up in the city and I kind of, you know, I grew up in uh, the country. So we didn't really cross paths, you know, that much, but, you know, I still really like, I, you know, I knew somewhat about him and he was like, Hey, and I still remember him, him telling my friend, uh, Emily, oh my gosh, she was like, like I saw her, I just, you know, and I, I told her the same thing. And I was like, I just, you know, I saw him and I was like, he opened the door for me and everything. And then it was kind of, it was just, I didn't leave the party with um, the guy I was talking to. <laughs> I actually left uh, with Riles and that was kind of like, I mean, that was it. Like, um, we just, we were never apart, you know, after that. I 100% remember, I remember what I was wearing. I remember, um, yeah, I remember everything about that night. It's kind of a funny joke because our, uh, I guess like our anniversary is on April Fool's Day. And I remember um, texting him and I was with my friend Emily. We were driving back to Troy. And um, I said, so is this going to be official or what? And he was like, he was like, absolutely. You know, like, this is official. And he was like, oh, never mind, April Fool's. And he was like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it was kind of like, it, it's, it was always a joke, really, to us that it, it happened on April Fool's Day that we kind of, um, you know, um, I guess sealed the deal. In a moment of heartfelt romance, Riles actually mustered up the courage to propose to Chelsea during a trip to New Orleans. I bet it was actually beautiful. Yeah. Their journey as a couple wasn't without its hurdles, and often it felt as if they were out of sync, struggling to align their paths at the same time. And he was having problems with, you know, prescription drugs that, like, he was having problems it kind of got to a point where, you know, we were on and off, on and off. A lot of people don't understand with, you know, whenever you love somebody so much, I had two, like, had two kids with him, you know? Um, and he was like the love of my life. And um, all I thought about all the time was, I'm gonna get a phone call today. I'm gonna get a phone call today. I'm gonna get a phone call today. Like that he's not here anymore, you know? And I mean, that's, that's enough anxiety for like anything because you just don't, you, you never know. You just, you never know. 
However, there was something profound that kept them pushing forward. I mean, we talked about it when I was like 22. We were in the middle of the lake, and I'll never forget it. We are in the middle of the lake, sitting on the back of the boat, talking about if, like, we had a kid. Like, we were literally talking about what would we name them and, like, all this other stuff. I mean, it was always family to him. He always wanted a family. Like, that's all, he, he always talks about that. A reason or two worth fighting for. Those reasons came in the form of two precious souls. Sailor, a beautiful little girl, and Sawyer, a handsome little boy. Despite the challenges Riles faced, his family refused to abandon him in the darkest hours. Instead, they rallied around him, providing unwavering support and understanding, hoping their love would help in guiding Riles towards a path of healing. I think the one thing that really stood out to me the most was that even though they would sometimes maybe administer a little tough love in the form of like, you know, you're going to have to try to help yourself. Riles knew he always had a place to fall back to as far as you can. We are always here to help you, but there are rules that are going to be in place. You have a place to live. You will always have a roof over your head. You will always have the family here to help you. But you've got to follow these rules in order to get that help. And these aren't in place to impede on your independence. These are really in place to help you, to protect you, to get you back on the path of well-being and safety because we're worried about you. We're concerned about you. We love you. Mm -hmm. I think in part, sometimes for for adults with addiction, when their parents are helping to intervene, it can make them feel like they're a child, not an adult. And sometimes that goes over well and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, So, you know, in my opinion, I feel like Wes and Jamie tried not to do that. They just tried to be clear that there were rules. Yeah. I got that impression. Yeah. Just, you know, do what you need to do. Mm-hmm. Don't bring it into the house. Don't have people over it. I mean, they also had kids were still at home. Yeah. And that idea seemed to be working because by December of 2013, Ross had moved into the pool house, which Wes described as more of a mother-in-law suite with a bedroom, a bathroom, and a living room slash game room area. It provided Ross, now 25, a sense of privacy and independence while allowing his family to remain close by. He and Chelsea were kind of at one of those phases where they weren't quite on the same page. So they had separated, and I think she was living back with her parents at this point, and he was living with his parents. But it still gave him that privacy, but still allowed him to live close to his family, including his daughter and his newborn son, because at that point, Sawyer had just been born. Yeah, he was just a baby. He was working with a roofing company at the time, and to Wes and Jamie and the rest of the family, he appeared happy and healthy. However, on December 13th, 2013, and in the weeks and months after, Wes and Jamie would begin to question everything they thought they knew. On December the 18th, uh, Mary Catherine and I drove up to the house at about 7.15, I guess. And um, I noticed a car parked behind his vehicle And uh, I, at that point, assumed it was one of his running buddies. He knew that we were at uh, Mary Catherine's volleyball or cheer. I forget what it was, one or the other. And we were probably late coming home. So I I assumed it was, you know, he had got one of his running buddies over there. So I told Mary Catherine to go into the the main house, which we had a... our, our house, and there was a pool in between what we call the pool house, but it's really like a mother in law suite. But anyway, so you know, we drive up and see this car, a silver Jetta, and you know, I just I knew whose car it was, who I, well, I thought of, I did. And so I go out there, and the door's locked, so I'm you know, banging on the door. And about this time, our youngest son, Matthew, drives up. And uh, he's got his girlfriend, and he's hearing me bang on the door, hollering, Riles, Riles, open this door. And then, so he's telling her to stay in the car. Uh, so, uh, but I go around, and um, so I'm, I'm knocking on his door, banging on the door, he won't open it. So I told him I'm going into the house to get, the main house to get the key. I come back out. I open the bedroom door. He had gone into the bathroom, locked that door. So... 
Uh, I didn't have a key to the interior bathroom door, but I did have a key to the exterior bathroom door. So I opened it and he had pulled the vanity drawer out so the door would not open all the way. I mean, it opened maybe two inches, you know, not wide enough for me to get my hand or nothing in there to flesh it. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of like, and there was only one person there, so I'm, I'm getting real confused at this point in time. Uh, so, um, and it was a split second. He took off back through the interior bedroom door, out the exterior bedroom door, ran around the pool the opposite way that Matthew was coming in. So Matthew saw him run. I really never... It happened so fast, I never really saw him run out. Because um, I was still trying to get in the bathroom, and it just happened. I, it happened in a split second. So Matthew sees him running, and he had his, all he had on, he was barefooted. He had no shirt on. He had his boxers on. So he runs um, around the opposite end of the house to the, to the street. And he sees Julian, our now daughter-in-law, um, in Matthew's home, Matthew's vehicle, and uh, he stops in the middle of the road and waves to her. Um, which you know we find out this all later, and then he keeps running, and he makes it to the entrance of our neighborhood on 84 West in Dothan. Uh, in Bokali subdivision. He was saying, stop chasing me, stop chasing me. And, but nobody was chasing him, you know, uh, unless he thought I was chasing him. So um, he makes it to the entrance and a friend of ours sees him. And she's driving by and she's just thinking, you know, he's kind of been over like trying to catch his breath, you know. She's just thinking, you know, he's, he's out jogging, but she didn't really notice that he was in his boxer, you know, maybe after after she was questioning all, she goes, I really, you know, it was nothing that was strange about that. You know, it looked like he may maybe a jogger and he stopped to catch his breath. Uh, you know, and I, she, she didn't pay that close attention that he didn't have his shoes on. Uh, and it could have been jogging pants so far as she knew, but they were his boxer. So to recap, Wes returned home on the evening of December 13th after picking up Mary Catherine and discovered a car parked behind Ryle's Jeep. Initially, he assumed that it belonged to one of Ryle's acquaintances, one who didn't always tread the straight and narrow path. Little did he know that the car actually belonged to Jillian, Matthew's then girlfriend, who would later become his wife. I can understand the concern when you pull in and you see a car that looks like somebody that you know is a not good influence on your child. And you've been spending this time with your son and he seems to finally really be doing well. But he has a history. That's scary. Yeah. And worrisome. And like, I feel like my stomach probably would have like dropped. Yeah. Hard on the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what happened because... Wes, concerned about the presence of one of Raul's old companions, made his way back to the pool house to address the situation head on, which is probably exactly what I would have done. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the encounter took an unexpected turn and spiraled into chaos. As Wes tried to deal with whatever was occurring in the pool house, Matthew and Jillian, unaware of the chaos transferring outside, arrived back home. Hearing the commotion and raised voices, Matthew circled around the house to see what was going on. To his surprise, Riles was darting towards the opposite end of the house, repeatedly yelling, Stop chasing me! I could only imagine, like, the shock on his face. I know. Could because, you just, I mean, I think I would have froze and just kind of, like, jaw drop, like, yeah, you know, what's going on. You almost expect to see somebody chasing him. Right. And nobody was chasing him. Mm -hmm. When Riles reached the front of the Chapman residence and noticed Jillian still seated in Matthew's car. In a brief pause, Riles waved to Jillian before resuming his journey to the front of the subdivision. That's so strange. I think he even smiled at her. Like, stopped yeah. and smiled, waved, and then kept running. Yeah. 
it gives you a pretty good clue as to maybe state of mind. That kind of makes you wonder, did he just leave? Yeah. Well, he was coherent enough to stop and register somebody in the car, wave. It's dark. Mm -hmm. Because in December, it gets dark at like four o'clock or something. It's dark early. Yeah. So I don't know. That just, it's so weird to me. It's so weird. It is weird. It is weird. Because it's, I, I almost want to say it's almost manic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because, you know, at one point he's in his place and then he's locking himself away in the bathroom and then he's running because he's panicking and then he's thinking he's being chased. So there may be paranoia and then he's waving and smiling. I mean, all of these different things going on in a pretty short time um, span. Yeah. You know, there there wasn't much time that passed between the time that Wes got there and... No, I think the, he said that was like around 7.30-ish, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, he goes into the pool house looking for anything that could help him understand what had just happened. He, he yeah. went back there thinking, oh, there's more than one person back here, realizes, no, right. there's just Riles. And then he finds trash bags of clothes. I think there was actually a a bag of drugs, a bag that had some pills in it. We're not sure Mm -hmm. exactly what they were. And so there's that question of had he planned to leave or really was maybe he was he not as sober as what they had thought this time? How or did he just maybe slip? You know, Mm -hmm. what had he taken something that night that just kind of derailed him? Maybe he had been clean and took something that night that just, yeah, you know. I mean, it could have been as as much as he had been clean, you know, in all of his things. He accidentally found something. Maybe so, found something yeah. that he hadn't that, gotten rid of, you know. That could be That true. happens, I'm sure, with people who, especially when they're, um, yeah, I'm not saying Riles did this, but a lot of people will hide things if they know that other people are trying to make, you know, get them to quit. And so, you know, if maybe he had done that at some point and just when he was doing whatever he was doing with all these clothes, that was, you know, something that happened. That And, you know, one thing that Wes made clear, you know, they didn't really know whether these clothes were something that Riles had packed that day, whether it was exactly. something Riles had packed a couple of weeks ago. For all they knew, this could have been bags of clothes that Riles had, had packed up for a while maybe in a closet, you know, and you talking about maybe he found it, it kind of just brought a thought to my mind of, was it in this bag of clothes when he moved back in? And Mm -hmm. was he, because they said, Wes said, it wasn't everything. These weren't all of his clothes. Right. So was he maybe going through looking for a specific shirt or pair Mm -hmm. of pants? Or was he like, oh, you know, I never unpacked these clothes. I never got these clothes out of the bag. Let me start putting these up or something, you know. And then as he's pulling these clothes out, putting them up, was it like, oh, there it is. Exactly. Yep. I could very well see that happening. You know, the other thing about it is I know he was taking prescription medication, but I don't know if he ever got any of that medication on the street rather than by prescription. And, you know, that sometimes that happens where it's tainted, as you say. And so, you know, if he got something with something on it, you know, then we're mixed with it. And and that's a possibility because after the first time that Rawls left for that extended period of time, you know, when Wes went to the doctor with him, Wes told him, no, I'm going to give you your medicine. Like the prescription says you should take it. And if he had been taking it, you know, like he wasn't supposed to, mm-hmm. then he no longer had access to that because now he was being monitored. So it's possible he turned to somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. In his bedroom, his, or the bathroom, he leaves his phone and um, leaves his wallet. And But he's got stuff sort of packed, if you will, but they're packed in trash bags, white trash bags. And like he's got like all his clothes separated, like, you know, white clothes here. And they're folded because he was, he, he was just very organized. So everything was just stacked like... Like, like somebody was going to leave. I, I can't say that it was all of it, but it was enough of it for us to say, well, you know, this stuff is a trash bag. I don't know why he had ever anything packed, but he did. 
He did. He had it on the opposite side of the bed where you couldn't see it. Like whenever you walked into the door into like the little like master, I guess, bedroom, um, you couldn't see the suitcase. It was on the opposite side of the bed. So you wouldn't have, you had to walk around the bed. And even if you like, even if you went into kind of like where the master, I guess, was, even if you went in there and just went to the closet and was like looking at stuff, you still, you really still wouldn't see out of like your peripheral or whatever that there was a bag packed until you went to the side of the bed. Like you just, you couldn't see it. So, um, you know, that's another thing. It's just like, what were you backing for? I don't know what he was, I don't know what he was running from. It's like he was, he was running from something, you know? And then, and, and the reason it makes me feel like that is because when Mr. West was trying to get him that day and he was just like, you know, yelling that somebody was chasing him, what, like, what the fuck was he running from? What was he running from? Um, and that's why it's just, I, I just, I don't, I don't know. That's why it, it's just, it, when I say that it, it was kind of like a light switch, it was. It was like I was talking to somebody completely different. Like, I mean. When he, when he went missing, he was working uh, at a temporary agency for a roofing company and putting a roof on um, Farley nuclear plant. Unknowing to us, uh, after he left, uh, he had quit that job that day before or that morning. He went to pick up his check that morning that he left. So he had money, uh, although he didn't take the money. And I feel like he was going to leave regardless of the circumstances. So in Raul's frenzied escape, he left behind everything he owned. His wallet, his cell phone, his keys, obviously his Jeep, his clothes, money, everything. We talk about the cell phone pings all the time and about how we take this kind of for granted now because they're really just kind of all attached to us and how we wish we had the same kind of location data back in the earlier cases, you know. Right, yep. But then we have this case here that happens in 2013 where there might would have been cell phone data available, except he didn't for he didn't it. have it. Yeah. And it's like, oh no, you yeah. know, because those it, cell phones can play such an important part in an investigation because sometimes that data can be collected long after some of the other physical evidence is even gone. Yeah. And I think, you know, yeah, the phone will still play a decent, you know, give us give us some decent clues as to who he'd been communicating with prior. Right. But, um, yeah, it was very unfortunate that he didn't do what most people do and take their phone with them. And it's different when somebody's kidnapped and they might not have their phone with them or something, but when they leave of their own accord, whether they do it in their right mind or not. And I think it's very telling, too, that he left all of these things behind and... As far as we know, he never came back to get any of it. Yeah. That's scary. It but is. two, so, how do you make it, where do you go? Like, if you're thinking about it in just... Just the terms of him leaving. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you go when you have nothing? Like, who would be the most likely person that you would go to to help you? If you can't go home because... You know your parents are mad at you, mm-hmm. or you're worried your parents are mad at you. Yeah, um, go to your girlfriend because you can't just- go to your girlfriend's, or maybe I don't even know that. I'm not even sure that her parents lived. I'm not sure how far they lived. Yeah, and he didn't have his phone, so he couldn't call. Right, so it's got to be somebody that's close enough. You know, he has to get some. Either he's got to get somewhere he can use a phone, mm-hmm. or it's got to be somebody within walking distance. Yeah, or, or somebody somebody's got to pick him up. Needs- Yep, maybe somebody that he already knew was supposed to be coming over anyway. But it's got to be somebody that he's comfortable enough with Mm -hmm. to feel like they're going to help him. Mm -hmm. Well, about 30 minutes later, after he left, a call comes into Ryle's phone. And Wes recognized the name and answered the call. And here's Wes talking about that. I got his phone from from the bathroom at the pool house and brought it in. 
it was just on the counter. It starts ringing. And I'm like, so I see the caller ID was Richard, um, uh, one of his friends. And I answered it. I'm like, Richard, what do you want? Can I talk to Riles? And I'm like, uh, no, Riles, we're not here. And, he, and so I said, what do you know? He just ran out, ran out of the house. What's going on? You know? He goes, well, I, he didn't know what was going on. He said, Riles owed him 20 bucks. And he was going to meet him at the end of our street because he was one of those people that we didn't allow in the house. And um, so that was that. was that. So we, we feel like several of his close friends, Richard was a close friend, and he had several of the close friends that we feel like may not know where he is now, but may have known something that night. And I'm telling you, don't you think that was convenient timing? Yeah, that is extremely convenient timing. Yeah, and I'm not sure I necessarily believe the story. Yeah, I don't really believe the story either. And that's not saying that he had anything to do with Ralph's disappearance or that he knows anything. Right. But it's just kind of strange, I guess. I agree. And maybe it's more odd because it was somebody that wasn't supposed to be at the house. And because there was this kind of planned meetup. Because Riles was supposed to pay him back. Yeah. And he, Riles ran that way and disappeared. Right. So, but again, not accusing him of anything. The Chapmans were hesitant to immediately report him missing. And in one of our initial conversations, Wes shared the criticisms they had faced for their delay and the contemplation of what ifs that followed. However, dwelling on the past and indulging in hypothetical scenarios serves no purpose in the present moment. Right. We can talk about what ifs all day, but it doesn't change that we're still here and that Riles is still missing. That's exactly right. At 25 years old, there are unique challenges for filing a missing person report on someone like Riles. You know, adults have that autonomy where they can decide that they're going to leave, even if it means not telling anybody they're leaving. And, and how many times have we had this conversation? Right. And he had done it before. You know, he got out of the car and just left. And there's no guarantee that even if they had called that night or within a couple of days, that the report would have been taken seriously. Yeah. I know that he goes back now and thinks, what if I had not went back there? What if I had taken a minute to think about who the car actually belonged to? What if we had filed the report earlier? But it, we talked about this, that as a parent, your first instinct goes to you pull up and you see this car that you think is an um, associate of your child that probably doesn't have their best interest at heart. And your immediate reaction is, I want what's best for my child, and this isn't it. Mm -hmm. So I think you did what any parent would do, knowing that maybe, yeah, Riles would get upset and he would leave, but he always came back. I mean, I kind of understand why there was that delay. I, I get that, too. I am... I couldn't say what I would do in the moment, but it seems very reasonable, and I could see myself doing the exact same thing. When Christmas came and went, they had a feeling this time it was different. Regrettably, when the Chapmans filed the missing person report on January 8th of 2014, law enforcement found themselves playing catch-up. The passage of time, compounded with rainy weather, had likely erased potential evidence, and any surveillance footage that could have been helpful was likely overwritten or lost. So, you know, this is when you start second-guessing yourself for delaying the report. Yep, exactly. But again, it doesn't help the situation to second-guess yourself, right? Right. And you have the holidays right there, too, mm -hmm. so that when you're thinking about, oh, there's no guarantee that a report would have been taken seriously— with the holidays going on, there's a lot of things that typically happen around the holidays. And 
there's a there's just a lot that's going on, and it makes you think that it might not have been taken quite as seriously at the time. It's very possible, yeah. Just because he is an adult, and he did not have anything. There were no illnesses or, you know, health-related concerns mm-hmm. to say, oh, he's absolutely in danger. And it's just kind of unfortunate. It is, yeah. And it's sad because even knowing now where we're at, that there's not a lot that could have changed how that went. Right. Well, these setbacks didn't dampen the collective spirit and determination of the Dothan community, police department, or Houston County Sheriff's Office. In a remarkable display of unity, they rallied determined to support the Chapmans and spare no effort at all in the search for Riles. That's when we, you know, filed shortly after that, we filed the police report. And um, that's, you know, that's when we started organizing um, search parties. Jamie and I would map out the, the city of Dothan and we would have, you know, 50, 60, 75 people show up. You know, with flyers going around putting flyers on telephone poles and all, you know, during uh, the downtown area. We would put the flyers out and, you know, we had several of those, started putting billboards up. At that time, Chris Barbary was the detective assigned to it, to his case. And he was instrumental in getting um, Southwest Panhandle Search and Rescue, the, uh, the dogs up here and organizing helicopter searches and in the news uh, we had two news stations we have three news stations here in in Dothan only two um, help us out it was a race of between the police department and the, and the um, sheriff's department of you know who would find it we just knew we would find it with all of this going on so um, you know we they had the horses here, the, the dogs here. They went and uh, took them down to Compass Lake, where we had our lake house, um, and, and did a search there. And all the family, of course, we were all interviewed. And the mayor, um, whose office is on the opposite side of my, my, my building, um, he came over and sat down and, you know, and we talked. And he put up a $10,000 reward. Um, so... I mean, it's, Dothan has really... And they really did show up for the Chapmans. And they continue to. They did. Yep. That, it seems like, you know, there's quite a few comments on Raul's post on the page. Yeah. There's been several shares. Um, But, you know, it's interesting because we actually had the opportunity to speak to Curtis Stevens, who is the investigator from Dothan Police Department currently on Rawls' case. And we didn't know it at the time. Um, we learned just recently, actually, from Wes, that that's the first time they have ever spoken to a podcast. Yeah, I was. Which. I mean, that made me feel honored. Yes. I mean, I think that's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal for us. Um, and it's a big deal for the family because it shows that they are still supporting them Mm -hmm. and that they are willing to do whatever it takes to get those answers. And I mean, like you said, it was kind of humbling, actually, that for the first interview that they did, they agreed to do it with us. Yeah. But despite all of those efforts, Riles still hasn't been located. I know no more today than I knew on December the 18th um, at, you know, 7.30ish or whatever, 7.15, 7.30. I, you know, I, I've heard rumors, a lot of rumors. We had uh, a situation where somebody had reported uh, less than two miles from us it, that Riles was buried in a shallow grave. Well, all of Dothan... Uh, you know, those in charge, they go out and, you know, bring machinery in and they bring the dogs in and the dogs catch, I guess, a scent of something. And then, you know, they got, it's at night or late in the afternoon, it already started turning night and um, they got 
bring in big lights, you know, and and every so they got this front end loader or a bucket truck or whatever, and they were so lightly, you know, just taking like an inch away at a time. And Matthew and I, Jamie could not go. Um, she just, you know, emotional situation. And so Matthew and, and I, I, I just remember we were sitting uh, probably 50 yards away watching all this unfold. You know, they had crime tape around it. And just the gut-wrenching, just fear um, that, you know, Riles could be there because he was so close to our house. And um, it was through the woods, you know, probably less than a mile as a pro flies, as, as they say, you know. He could have gone through the woods over a creek and, you know, been there. But, uh uh, that went on for, oh gosh, I, it seemed like forever, but it's probably two or three hours of, and, and finally it was, thank goodness it wasn't Riles, but, uh, it was, um, just dead carcasses, uh, animal carcasses that, and, and they had dug a place as big as a large swimming pool. So, uh, they were, you know, that, that was a lead that it didn't pan out. And, but that was a lead that somebody gave us specific area. And they carried the dogs and the dogs picked up a scent. You know, so that's what we haven't had. We haven't had specific locations and, and, and a lot of the um, rumors that are, are stories that we get, you know, of him uh, going back to that, that trip to Birmingham uh, to buy drugs and, and OD and, and them dumping him. Well, we're in southeast Alabama. We have a lot of hunters. And my view is if somebody just dumped a body on the side of the road, the body would have been found shortly after that. Now, there have been stories along the way, which we had one that was very promising. A, a, a girl graduated with Riles from high school and she was working in um, in Panama City at Club La Vila, I think it was. She was a bartender or a waitress and she was waiting the beach area and she goes up and talks to Riles and there was a, a girl with Riles and a guy with Riles that were very tattooed and We've always had suspicion that these people knew something. They're in and out of jail, these two people. Let me back up. Uh, how we found this out is a good friend of ours, he, his son was down in Panama City, and um, he had gone down to have dinner with him, and his son was dating this girl. He, The son brought the girl to dinner, and at that time, there was another guy missing that they had located in Panama City. Nothing to do with Riles. And so they, that's how it spurred up the conversation. And Wes uh, told his son, like, gosh, I wish the Chapmans can find Riles. And so the girlfriend that was the waitress spoke up and said, what are you talking about? And that's how we learned that she spoke with Riles out on the beach at spring break the following year in, in 2014, um, around March-ish, March, April, you know, when spring break is. And as it goes on, she says, when Riles left, he said, whatever you do, don't tell my mom and dad you saw me. She would have no reason. I mean, because it, Number one, she was the one that come forward and told our friend that, hey, he's not missing. I just talked to him. And um, so that at that point, when Wes called me, you know, that let us know that, you know, Riles is OK, uh, at least the spring break. The only thing that that I can do now is just believe that he's alive until somebody proves me otherwise. I think we say in every episode, if you know something, say something. And we we just can't stress that enough that 
this is so important in getting information out at, at any time. But the sooner you can get it, the better. If you see someone that looks like Riles or any missing person, really, and you can snap a photo, that's great. But if you can't, getting the information in quickly with the details of the location, date, time, anything you can give them is just as helpful because it gives the investigators time to check surrounding areas for surveillance footage that might be available or locate people who may have been in the area at the same time. And I just can't emphasize in, enough how important it is time passing just makes it you know more difficult. Yeah, because... I mean, there are things that can be done, especially now that technology has evolved so much. Right. There are things that can be done to kind of recover things, you know, as long as it's discovered within a reasonable amount of time. Right. And if it's a recent sighting even, you know, then that's even more important. I mean, just recently we had somebody comment about someone who had been missing for over 20 years, and they actually thought they'd seen them in Florida. They didn't get a picture, but what they did get was a whole lot of detail. Right. The date, the time, the location, what the person had on. Where they were, you know, as far as people they talked to. Mm -hmm. And we were able to communicate yeah. that to the family and law enforcement. And the family actually went to... um the location and spoke to the owner who was able to pull the surveillance footage, even though it was almost a week later and it wasn't the person that we were looking for, unfortunately. But we did but, find the person that they saw. Yeah, it, what the person was on there. Mm -hmm. And because they had come forward with that information, when they did, it was still available on the surveillance video, which allowed the family to confirm yes or no, that was who they were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, even just coming out with the details like that helps. Yeah. It's so helpful. Yeah. And, you know, by the same token, yes, you want to know that that is or isn't, you know, but if they hadn't come forward right away, if they'd have waited even another week, this could have been a whole different outcome. They could have still been looking and wondering and trying to track down this person and maybe never even seen them again. Exactly. And like we said earlier, we did catch up with Detective Stevens. And while most of our conversation was off the record, he did give us a statement that we could use on the episode. Now, we always want everyone to know that, that we're always more than willing to accept any information about the Riles Chapman case. Um, they, they can send any information and call our um, dispatch at 793-0215, sorry, 334-793-0215, and um, they can give them the information. They'll make sure it gets to me, um, Sergeant Stevens, or somebody in the um, Violent Crimes Division, and um, we would definitely follow up on any information that we receive. We, you know, we'd like, we'd like to keep cases active as, if at all possible. The impact of Raul's disappearance extends far beyond his parents, siblings, Chelsea, and friends. It has left an indelible mark on his children, Sailor and Sawyer. When a missing person case involves children, the repercussions are particularly profound. Sailor was merely two years old and Sawyer just a few months old when their father vanished from their lives. The void left by his absence has undoubtedly shaped their young hearts and minds, leaving them with unanswered questions and an incomprehensible loss. The weight of uncertainty that accompanies a missing person case, especially for children, is immeasurable. The incessant thoughts about what might have happened, the longing for answers, and the struggle to navigate a reality without their father can be simply overwhelming. As they grow older, the questions they carry with them become more complex, echoing the longing for closure that resonates with their family and community. The burden of responsibility falls on those closest to Sailor and Sawyer, their family members who yearn to provide them with the truth and guidance they deserve. The search for answers becomes not only a pursuit of justice, but also an act of love and protection for these innocent souls. It is a plea to anyone 
who holds the key to unlocking the mystery surrounding Raul's disappearance. In addition to sitting down with Wes, we also spoke with Chelsea, who you heard a little bit earlier, and Chelsea and Raul's daughter, Sailor. We don't often get to hear from the children that are being affected by the disappearances of their parents, especially the young children. Sailor actually wanted the chance to speak about her dad. So we sat down with her when we spoke to Chelsea to give her the opportunity for her voice to be heard. So Sailor, can you tell us how old you are? And tell me tell me a little bit about the best friend that you were just telling me about too. Well, I'm 11 and my best friend, uh, she lives next door and she has my dad's birthday. And we both like the same things and we actually look alike. <laughs> Which I find fascinating. I was like, sometimes people gravitate to people who look like themselves, which is kind of fun. Also, sometimes they get pets that look like themselves. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And pretty special that, you know, she has a special birthday. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that. We would like to hear what you remember about your daddy. Okay. Well, I've heard stories, and um, I remember the lake house. Um, He used to, like, take me on the boat, and we would take so many pictures, and I have those pictures on my phone. And um, we would do, like, boat rides, and I would play in the water, and I was a little chubby baby. (laughs) (laughs) And we used to, like play at the lake house and I we had this like baby swing so I would swing on that and he would push me and um like I mostly remember the boat rides yeah those are good memories though that's wonderful that's nice that you have pictures too yeah yeah of all the memories that you have and what you can what you can think of what do you think you miss the most about your daddy well, um, I miss our boat rides and riding the, on the dirt roads. Yeah. On the dirt roads. Okay, wait a minute. What's with that? <laughs> um, well, I think uh, we used to ride the four-wheelers and... Um, and, his, and his Jeep. Yeah, and the a, Jeep. I have a picture of you hanging out in the window. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Daredevil. Yeah. Know, right? No, he would he would just let her like stand up in the seat like beside him and mm-hmm. they would ride dirt roads and uh she would just be like just looking out the window, just standing up in the seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That's awesome. Is there anything else that you would like to share specifically about your daddy today? Well, um I just miss him a lot. I bet. Yeah. Was there anything um, maybe you and your mama have been talking about that maybe why you might have wanted to come on and talk to us today? It's okay. If you don't, that's okay. I'm sorry. I know this is hard, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I bet. You know, I can see how you would miss your daddy because we've heard so many neat stories about him. Yeah. And he seems like a really nice guy. He was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, his birthday will be the 30th. And just like every birthday, we we normally get a little cake and we send happy birthday to him. You know, and uh, so birthdays are always, birthdays and holidays were always real special to us. And, um, you know, he's, he's out there somewhere. Um, so... You know, I, I want him to know that we care about him and we'll do everything in our power to help him. Yeah, um, just like I, just like I said before, you know, if, if Riles hears this by chance, um, you know, we're here for him. Of course, ideally, we'd love for him to be home. We'd love for him to have a relationship with his kids. But if it's something that he can't come home for, um, just let us know. I mean, he's an adult. We're not chasing him down and, and you know, Raj, you got to come home. That, that, that. We just want to know that he's okay. Yeah. 
here again. I've, I've got the same phone number. Uh, we're back in the house that he grew up in. Um, we've, we've since moved from the Bocage house and we're at the house um, that they were in high school um, in. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm at my office is at the same place. Uh, I would like nothing better than him just walk in the door. I mean, you know, there don't have to be an explanation. We wouldn't pressure him at all. We just want to know that he's okay. Yeah, I would, I would want to tell them that um, if you, you know, if you think that um, you see him or anything like that, um, don't wait. Like, just please. I know that it's like, it, it may be where you don't really even think about it because it's been, I mean, it, it has been a long time, you know, um, but if you think for just just a second that that it is him, it, it's not going to do anything to you. Just call the cops right then. Like, don't don't wait a couple days or or, you know, anything like that, because don't like, just call like call right then because anything is better than nothing you know um so so don't don't wait and um and, and and try to reach out to me or the chapmans or anything like that like two or three days later just do it right then you're not you're not going to feel like don't feel dumb or anything i mean just right then do it and if he's if he's okay we're so proud of him and if he's not okay, we're still proud of him, but we want to help him. He's not alone in this. And that we love him deeply. Riles was um, super, he was super tenderhearted. Like he loved with everything he had. He had the biggest heart. Like, I mean, he would, he would give and he would help and he would do whatever he, um, he needed to do, even if he had nothing, you know, he, he would still, he would give whatever was left. He just, his heart is just, is golden. I just wish he knew, um, just, um, his little girl is kind of, uh, you know, having, um, she just wants to be wanted. She just wants to be wanted by somebody, you know? And um, I just feel like it stems from that. You know, I just wish that, um, I don't know, I feel, like, I feel like he's probably embarrassed more than anything if, you know, it's been this long, um, you know? If, if, if it is the case where, um, you know, he knows what he found, just wants to do what he wants to do and, you know, whatnot. Um, I just, uh, I hope that he sees the, you know, Facebook that, um, you know, the Chapman's created uh, for him. And um, we always uh, put on there, um, you know, timelines uh, of the kids and they're just, um, I don't know, they're just, they're so big now. You know. I just miss him a lot. At the time of his disappearance, Riles was 25 years old. He was described as being between six foot and six foot three and 175 to 180 pounds with short brown hair and blue eyes. He had several tattoos, including Chapman across his back, Sailor Grace across his chest, and Mary Catherine on his side. If you have any information related to the disappearance of Ross Chapman, please contact Dothan Police Department at 334-615-3000. You may also message Find Ross Chapman on Facebook or contact us on the Alabama Cold Case Advocacy website or Facebook page. 
Since Alabama Cold Case Advocacy's creation, we have dedicated innumerable hours to researching and networking in an effort to provide the largest platform we can to the cases we share. We shoulder all associated expenses with Alabama Cold Case Advocacy out of our own pocket, including the subscription fees for researching and production of the Unforgotten podcast to provide a cost-free avenue for the victims' families of those cases. We hope you will join in our efforts to raise awareness of Alabama's missing and murdered and support these families who have been forced to carry the immeasurable loss of their loved ones and the fight for answers. If you appreciate our mission and you are inspired to make a donation, your extra support will enable the ACCA to continue our research, share the cold cases, and help those families know that they are also unforgotten. Unforgotten is an Alabama cold case advocacy podcast recorded in conjunction with Riverside FM, hosted and distributed by Spotify for podcasters, available on your favorite podcast platform. Intro music for the show was created by Principles of Uncertainty, who also mixed and mastered this episode. Content and production is by Sellers and Stormy. Artwork by Sellers. Credits for music, sound clips, special mentions, and any source referenced in our podcast can be found in each episode's description. We hope you will join us on all the major social media sites and continue to raise awareness of our Alabama cold cases. Until next time, thank you for listening, and remember, justice may be delayed, but the victims and their families remain unforgotten.